Priest. I'm playing the part of Dan Klingenspitz. So, um, as, as we went through preparing for your slated panels today, um, we realized that um, I have the deep knowledge to um, introduce you to these gentlemen. And um, part of what I have been doing for the better part of, I think, a year and a half at Hasbro, um, it really started when we did our Hasbro Universe Writer's Room. Um, it was uh, last summer as we started to work with Paramount, get ready for you know, what was going to come. What we did is we wanted to dress a room on the Paramount set with all kinds of um, artifacts and, and, and things related to the brands that we'd be talking about. So I said, wow, I've got to get some great Joe stuff, but I knew we had artwork on the walls and different things like that. So I set about a task to find every single G.I. Joe painting that still existed within Hasbro, every piece of art that we had. And it was an amazing adventure and an amazing journey. And, um, you know, searching nooks and crannies and basements and every whispered rumor, you should talk to this person, they might have something and know where it is. And, and literally, the treasures came. They were, you know, almost forgotten storage units, um, you know, and the caches and basements. It's been an amazing journey. That's, that's really not the important thing. Um, the good news is we have a lot of treasures, and that's really what this show is about, is sharing those with you. But the more amazing thing is actually meeting the folks behind those treasures. And, um, you know, I've worked with actually Bob for a number of years. Um, but Doug, uh, I was just introduced to him, and Doug has come in on numerous times to take me through the, the pile of paintings, talking about technique, who did what, and, and uh, we'll talk in a second about the influence of Hector Garrido. So, you know, and these two guys have taught me so much about the process of how Joe was created in the paintings. It's been an amazing experience. I want to thank you guys for that. And we're going to share uh, that with you now, too. So let me, uh, let me introduce uh, to you, this is um, Doug Hart uh, next to me. Doug started in 1984 on G.I. Joe. So as we know, Joe vs. Cobra was launched in 1982. The first uh, package artist was Hector Garrido. Doug was hired with the success of Joe. They needed more hands. And so Doug was brought in and did an amazing number of the Joe paintings. Um, and Doug worked at Hasbro uh, through 99. I'll have Doug talk about the other brands he worked on in a second as well. And then we have Bob Lavoie. And Bob started in 85. And, and you moved into the illustration group. So actually painting package illustrations in 1990 and was there for four years. So during that phase of G.I. Joe, 90 to 94, um, you'll see the influence of Bob in the line. And then Bob, um, and I worked with Bob for many years, all the way uh, till 2013 when Bob retired. And uh, both of these gentlemen, Bob still, uh, he works with us today, contracts with us in the consumer products division. So we see each other every day, so he still continues on. And Doug actually still uh, freelances for us, and he most recently did the Action Man 50th anniversary paintings for our European release, so still involved with us today. So that said, why don't you guys also talk about, um, just quickly top line the other brands you worked on, because one thing we, I found in doing the stories, you know, painters or illustrators weren't just dedicated to one brand, you were assigned to, to go everywhere. You you were needed, so. It's very unusual to um, to have an in-house illustrator. So I was one of the first ones that they uh, that they had, and everything else was all freelance. But I was brought in basically to do uh, start off with a cabbage patch telephone, <laughs> and it was all the, deca the decals. And but what I worked at was in the packaging department. But I, then I went out and I, I branched out into uh, My Little Pony. And I did that for a, a few years. And um, I always wanted to bring that technique of My Little Pony more to look like Disney. Because I wanted to like real artwork. So I kept, I did that for a while. And that's another different technique. And then I always, my, my hero was looking at Hector's stuff. And I really didn't work with acrylics that much. And so it's a different, different medium. Like the other, like Pony is done in wash and a little bit of airbrush, which I brought into the to the company. Air, airbrushing because my background was uh, jewelry design, so very, very extremely tight uh, airbrushing and jewelry design. But um, and then I started. Um, 
you know, look, uh, practicing at home, doing some of the GI Joe, uh, working with acrylics, looking at uh, like Boris Bell Joe, uh, oh. his, his yeah. work, and then practicing with acrylics. And so, and then I started uh, trying to get some, uh, you know, begging my boss, Matt Isaac, that uh, I think I can do this too. And so then I started doing more than Joe. And that probably, that was probably 19, I don't know, 87 or 88 or whatever. And then, and then they, the lines got so big that they had to split them up, where I did Ninja Forces and uh, Tiger Forces and uh, DE, DEF Forces. Um, and uh, and each, each one had like five or six characters. <coughs> so, um, but uh, then I did anything in between. I started doing aerators, uh, which was a lot of, a lot of mm -hmm. fun. Um, I worked with another different techniques, uh, gem. I worked on gem with figures. I, my, my specialty is, my specialty, well, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I, I was born with doing, yeah. I like doing faces and figures. A lot of people don't do figures and faces, and that's what I always, uh, was my, uh, my, uh, my gift to uh, do things and faces, so. But that wasn't even e that, that easy either for me because I had to reduce the head sizes. To what I had to do. <laughs> yes. so and and if I more reduce the head sizes, the better off they look, more, more uh, muscular. So, yeah, yeah that's, if, you, if you know that, so. Yeah, that's something that our, our design team knows when they, when they sculpt. The smaller you make the head, the, it looks like a larger, more opposing thing. You always have a kid in the candy yeah. shop, really, to do all that art. That's an amazing range. I mean, just My Little Pony, Jim, um, G.I. Joe, and then some of the other brands. You mentioned Tribes earlier was another one. I don't know that well. So basically, as an illustrator, like you say, we didn't have many of them. You had to be generalist and, and go where the work, you know, where the, the need took you. Right. I had to be a squeaky wheel, too. Because every time I saw something, I think I could do this. Give me that. Practice at home, like jam or something. They were totally different techniques. Jam uh, was done by a woman on the outside, Sharon Mattel, a very talented person. And uh, she, she worked for Ann and Hope, and the, which for figures and faces too. But she worked in a technique with uh, outlining pencil and color pencil and stuff, and, which is like uh, Drew Struzan. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows. Yeah. That's his technique with uh, outlining. Pencil, the pencil. Yeah. Uh, but um, and actually, there was a person years ago that did TV TV guy it was called um, uh, Ansel, and uh, he lived in California. But he did uh, th uh, in, uh, uh, the Thunderdome with uh, Bill Gibson. Yeah. A lot of those uh, movie movie posters. And that's a technique. That's the, another technique. But that's what she got that from. Um, but. Uh, so, Bob, what, uh, what's your body of work? Um, well, I came in, uh, an illustrator of Dave Graves, well, was it Dave Graves? Yes. Uh, one of the illustrators left and was working in the uh, catalog. We used to shoot Toy Fair catalog and a lot of consumer stuff. And when I found an illustration opening came up, I thought, you know, I was a painting man in college. I had always painted in oils, I had never painted in anything else. And, but I figured, you know, I went over and talked to Doug, we knew each other. And he said, well, do some samples. And I went home, and every night I worked until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning doing samples. And, um, until finally he said, yeah, enough is enough. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll take it. Give me an assignment. Right. So he hired me, and I was just saying, the, the first job I had was a Cabbage Patch kit. Um, so if you know what they are, they're, it's a pink circle about this big, <laughs> with two eyes and his mouth, you know, done in pencil. Uh, two weeks later, I still didn't have a finished cat. I, the airbrush would spit. It was the, I mean, it took me two weeks, literally two weeks, to do a, a pink circle. I finally went home and told my wife, I'm screwed. I'll, 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 I'll never be able to do this. But Doug, you know, uh, Doug helped me along. I got that done. And like him, we worked on a lot. We, they would schedule us on jobs. So I did a lot of play school stuff. I would do um, G.I. Joe comps. You know, a lot of, the, a lot of the early stuff, I would do a comp. 
and then Doug would do the final. Um, you know, I worked on Transformers at the end, I worked on Poem. And we had to, if you were doing something, you had to match the style of the person before you. So, you know, to be a, an illustrator there, you had to really be a, a really good mimic. And luckily, I, I could match styles. And that's it. Doug taught me pretty much. I mean, he's, he was an amazing person to work with. And was, you know, he taught me lighting, he taught me, as you'll see in the illustrations, you know, when you go through, you know, reflective light. And I was terrible at figures, and I still, I, I, do, <laughs> I do not paint people. Um, and of course, doing vehicles, there were always people in it. And I would pencil the whole thing out and leave it right into the end. You're, you're very, you're, you're too self-critical. Your figures are great. Said, you know, eventually, you're going to have to paint. <laughs> your, fig your, your two, uh, your figures are great. Actually, Doug came in when you weren't around. He said, what? what's he talking about? <laughs> figures I, was, I never had any confidence in them. So. But speaking of the apprenticeship system, so that's one thing that I've heard over and over about Hasbro during, during the days of G.I. Joe is great, great teaching, oh, passing down techniques and training the next generation. It was more than I ever learned in college. And that's a, that's a great segue, actually, to talk about the third, you know, influential illustrator in the G.I. Joe line, and that's the, the one who set the tone at, at the start, Hector Garrido. Now, um, Hector is, he's still with us, he's 90, year, 90 years old, um, lives in Connecticut, but he's never been one to really want to go out in the public or go to shows. So we reached out, he just, he just doesn't travel. Um, so, you know, hopefully in the future, maybe we get a video greeting from something from Hector, that would be a good thing to do. But it's difficult to understate the importance of Hector's role in setting the tone and the pace uh, for, for G.I. Joe. We'll talk about that in a minute because there was learning and following Hector's technique. Um, and so just uh, a quick survey. Mostly what we're gonna see today is a lot of Doug's work. So we still have a lot of examples of, of Doug's work in the building. So we wanna cover Bob's here. So Bob's got quite a, a range as well. Um, talking about figural, um, you know, figures uh, doing the pilots for the battle copters and air commandos, um, the Barracuda razor blade. I love, I love the razor blade. It's just such a cool illustration. One of my favorite vehicles is the, the Awe Striker and the Eco Striker version. It's such a cool, uh, cool take on that. As well as um, these are some of the other things Bob did. So the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame was introduced. He, um, you know, he did uh, the Strike Cycle and I think some others in the line. But then he also did a lot of work on the consumer product side, so it's almost this cool etching uh, that he did for, um, I'm actually not sure where that was used, but. Uh, back, back of the uh, Toy Fair line art catalog. So it's a really, really cool piece. I, the, the detail is just stunning. So these are things, you, like the number of ima you know, images and details in that scene is just amazing for you know, a uh, consumer products piece. <laughs> I have no idea that they wanted a kid in Oh yeah, they can. What is the what is with the kid? No idea. Thank you for reminding me that. I asked the same thing. I'm like, what's with that kid in there? I have no idea. I think it was like oh, it was the kid's dream to be out there in this battle. I don't know. It's like it's like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like like, yeah, you got a roadblock in there about to kick a giant anaconda. It's like excited. It's like they're all protecting the kid. Yeah. This kid will save the world. We have to protect the kid. So there's a story there. We just don't know what it is. <laughs> all right. So um, we want to talk about the style of G.I. Joe a little bit. So very distinctive style set early, um, but we'll cover the white lines in a second because that's a really funny thing. So fellas, and especially Doug, because you did, you did get to meet Hector, at least I think on one occasion, um, where he came in and, and you guys kind of worked together to talk about the line. But the style of G.I. Joe was very different from anything else on the shelf at the time. As you, you know, learned it and learned how the craft and followed Hector's work, how do you describe it and how, how did, did G.I. Joe come to, to occupy, you know, this kind of style. How would you describe it? It's very illustrated. Um, yeah, just well, brilliant. I yeah. Mean, so quick. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, um, it was inspiring, really. You know, to, uh, but uh, yeah. And everything, even you know, from the very beginning, 82, everything uh, tells a story. It's all about action. There's an ex everything has an explosion, right? <laughs> you know? well, so, well, they they couldn't do it. At the they couldn't do the flashing. When uh, Alan has it, fellas, yeah, he wouldn't have any flashing. And, and, the, uh, and the guy 
like the muzzle flash? Muzzle flash. Okay. So that, that didn't happen until he passed away. Okay. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's right. And so, and Hector, um, if you don't know his background, was a, uh, he's animated so many pulps, right? That was really what he's known for. So he can work fast, right? Um, and, but also tremendously, you know, uh, explosive and evocative because that's what he was kind of trained to do. Um, so Hector really um, set the tone and then to Doug's prior point, we were showing um, both Hector's work and your work side by side. So, um, so in this case, the Battle Force 2000, that's when the line was really expanding and Doug was brought in on the line and it's clear that what they did is divide and conquer. We've got to get these out. And so Doug had to, to learn to follow and you know, they look like they're done by the same hand. So, you know, it, it's a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot, lot of talent to follow someone else. <laughs> the problem, the problem is with uh, with this was doing the digital in the background. It was one pain in the neck. Those were done with Mavi mockers. Oh, the the lines, yeah, yeah the, lines the background. Back. I would have much rather done the explosions. <laughs> much easier to do. This was not easy to do. Because you had to stop with the lighter color, then the next color, and you had to take the Mavi marker and actually chisel it so it would become flat, you know? And uh, those were like ty very time consuming. If you got a line wrong, you yeah, check the painting, finally, I do it all over. to the printer, like, geez, you think you could make just like, uh, you know, some graphic stuff on this so we don't have to do this anymore? Because it would take like a day or more to do those. Wow. Digital, yeah. And did they? It was a nightmare. I'm, still coming I'm looking at it now and I'm having a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I said there was no Command Z either, you know, we couldn't undo. So you had one that was a little crazy. And, and you couldn't paint it right. because the mobby mocker would bleed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you had to use like you know, bleed white. Uh, well, yeah. that's, like, that's a good start. <laughs> All right, we'll move on from that. <laughs> Let's not talk, let's, let's just change the subject. <laughs> but uh, one, of, one of the things that, that Doug told me when he came in on our first meeting, he told me about his process and technique, how he found models to actually do his craft. And this is amazing. So then um, on, the, on the second visit, Doug brought me a giant envelope full of Polaroids. And we're going to take a look at that. So I want you to describe your technique and how you went about Finding reference. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> when you're drawing people's and faces and portraits, and if you don't have anything in front of you, it's going to look like yourself, and that's just the way it is. And so, you, you, and you struggle with the face and the eyes and this and the that, and it's just the way it is. So I started. I took it on myself just to grab people that I work with and said, "Come on in." We're going to rim light here and do this and make a mean face, and I'll use that as, your, as the face. And then I do, the, <laughs> and then I would do the figure separate, the, with the posing and the arms and the, the you know the, the legs and the kicking and all that. I do that separately, and then, then I combine. So Bob, that's, that's a good example. example. That's that's, that's Bob up that's there. Bob. <laughs> so Bob, Bob is bazooka. I was young. I, <laughs> <laughs> so. That, that's an example of how you, you did the, uh, the portrait with the rim lining and then the, the figural shot. So you, you took then, both of them yeah. together. The photographer was, was good, so I, I, I always asked for rim lining. And that changed it from Hector's. Hector's was kind of flat. There was no light source a lot of times. So I, created, I wanted to create more of a dramatic way with light sources, which is probably from movie posters and stuff like that. Very dramatic. Now, these, I think Kirk is an amazing example of emotion, you know, coming through. Right. We're going to see some really good ones, and then at the end we're going to see some not so good ones. Not so good ones. <laughs> because not everybody can make faces like this. So. Um, oh, and that's Mike McGill, right? That's uh, Mike Major Bless. Sorry, Mike, that's we, worked, we worked with Mike when I started the company. That's Bob. So it's interesting, um, looking at what Bob is holding. Yes, that was the other He's actually thing. holding nothing. <laughs> but yet, in the package, he's got a giant blaster. Blaster. But they used to, I was saying to the sculptor here, that I've known for like, when I was working there. Kirk, yeah. Kirk. 
And uh, it, what, what artists do, and Disney does that too, is they'll, they'll they see sculpt it first, or they have something that they can go by, so they can turn it, and flip it, and do this and do that. So I I asked they had Kurt for some plastiline because they'd give me flat sculpture sheets. And the flat sculpture sheets would only be one view, this view, that view, but it ain't going this way with the, uh, in perspective. So I, I'd get the plastiline, and I'd just pop it all together to see what's going up and down this way and that way, and then put it over there and then photograph it, and then just trace it off, and then pop it in Bob's hands or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't give you toy reference, they did you not. made you had to make it up. Yeah, you just got yeah. it. We, we, no, we'd get the reference and go like, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I did the vehicles, all we had were were engineering drawings. And then front yeah. side. <coughs> That's it. Yeah. And then we had to look at that and say, oh, okay, well, it's got to be three quarters coming at you. Yeah. Wow. You know, disappearing. And, I mean, so it was. I, wow. I did a lot, that. A lot of yes. made up stuff. I asked Kirk if he wants his plastiline back. <laughs> Kirk, Kirk will take it. He's a, he's a collector. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's look at a few more. So um, this this right here is another fellow we worked with, Bob, Harry Heen. Yeah, right yeah. Look, at Harry's face became Road Pig. And the funny thing is, Road Pig is a huge dude. Harry is not, right? Uh, but his face is like the most terror-filled face of, of all of them. Um, this is Joe Rainham, he is Keel Hall. And Joe still works at the company to this day. I think he's been there 40 years. He started when he was a, a kid. Um, and he's one of our uh, facilities guys. He's amazing. Um, so I salute him in the hallway now when I go by Keel Hall. However you know salute. And then, um, let's see, who is that? Um, I don't know. Ross Yeah, but yeah. that's a very good example of the, the, what I used to try to do with that. Try to pick the person. Yeah, who, who fit the role. Um, here's some more. So he that's was, he was one of the better. He was like, a, he, he, the kid, the guy was like a movie star. He was like, I, every time I needed a, a subject, I'd grab him and uh, he would be, uh, he would be a good. So I, um, I screwed up the presentation. Ah! So that's supposed to be Vinny's picture there. It's, yeah. it's not. Obviously. Sorry, Vinny. Is and, Vinny here? Apologies. He'll be coming later. Sorry, Vinny. And then um, the other one too. I try to change it from Hector's. Is Hector's sometimes were a little bit stiff <coughs> with just the kneeling or standing or this or that. I tried to get a little bit more foreshortened, like comic book type stuff. Oh yeah. like Spider-Man. So that would I'd be use a little bit of that in there. And, and then a little bit more action. The Ninja Commandos are a great example of that because they're like full body in motion in the air. Vinny, Vinny is actually from the mob, uh, DC, some of the sculpture things, that they, you know, the black and white uh, poses that they used to have, generic poses, and that's from Batman actually, him running. Oh, that one? That, that <laughs> one. And then these are from probably from uh, Spider-Man or one of those others, just to get the idea. So here's a few more. more. Yeah, if you found those, yeah. Well. Yeah, is that Gets Guy? The which, what? what? That's, that's Guy, guy Cassidy. Yeah, yeah. got it. <laughs> no, did, uh, Phil Regan. Oh, sorry, there's Vinny. So I don't, I don't know what them. There, yeah, ugly man. <laughs> that dude is a perfect uh, cesspool. Phil Regan was obviously very good. That was the guy in the middle. Yeah. He was a very good faces, which. Which didn't happen a lot. A lot of people, they couldn't make a grimacing face. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. Oh, they found that. Oh, they yeah. Found that. yeah, Scarlet, yeah. And he was good. No? Yeah. That's the DEF. Yeah. And then that's the Stink Has, Stink Has Role Play, so a good example of how you, you captured that. That's a much bigger blaster in the package than he was holding in his hand. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> they got artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> That's marketing, overselling. Um, okay, so here's, here's some examples, right? So sometimes they're great. That's Dave Kunitz over there on the, on the right. Um, just a phenomenal yell. But sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> couldn't get it. <laughs> we're gonna kick him in the shins and try to give a grimacing face. It was impossible. 
Like they look like they're both in pain. Yeah. <laughs> right? But that's not what you were going for. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So, um, so thank you for sharing those. So um, that's great. That's so fun to see that. Um, Yeah, I think, I I think, think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, I also did, uh, for Milton Bradley, I did um, uh, mural puzzles. So I needed uh, whole battle scenes in that. So I had, so that might be from that too. But I think you're right though, yeah. yeah. So one, one thing I wanted to talk about, and so these are examples of, of uh, Doug's work as well, is really, I wanted you to talk about the insane amount detail, environmental detail in addition to the vehicles and the figures themselves that you put in into Joe. Because when everything was put on the package at the end, all the legal copy and the names everything, a lot of this detail was obliterated. But you look at the paintings and it's there. They're just unbelievable. Yeah. So they were zigging and I'm sagging. Yeah. That because the graphics kept getting bigger and bigger and moving around and it, they disappeared. So I used to throw as much stuff as I can in there. So Maybe they'll be inspired to, like, make, maybe the package will be bigger. Okay. Maybe. So you want it to blow away. Like, that ace battle A lot copter. of it gets cropped. A lot of it gets cropped. That ace battle copter goes up to infinity with the, with the clouds. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's so beautiful, right? And all, the, and all the details in the snow and the ground, it's just uh, it's amazing work. It doesn't always come true. I think the, the meat dog, you know, you get it. That, that package has, you know, you see all that. Yeah, but yeah. there's so much more. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the vehicle packages sometimes. Yeah, that. And so, and another thing that we talked about was adding the special effects because, you know, we realized helicopter blades are a very difficult mm -hmm. thing, you know, the, the war. So you guys created a technique to add those in the, in the package. Why don't you talk about that? Well, the speed, <coughs> just to doing speed lines or trying to get it so it looks like it's spinning up, you know, like this. And that was airbrushed. But you just take it and then you make a stencil and then you, you repeat it and with the airbrush to make it look like it's moving. It's, it's that particular one. Yeah. So both of these here actually have that acetate layer and right. you made a stencil and then just repeat yeah. it all and, around the acetate. Right. And now you can see actually on uh, that was done on an overlay because you can see the acetate, the, the glare of the acetate. So it didn't, it didn't disturb from the actual painting. And then the other effect was uh, when you're illustrating something that the guy that put the person way behind or in, in a, a tinted uh, capsule like that, you had to illustrate the whole thing first and then cut a stencil and then spray it and then push them back as you uh, And that's what that comes from. You can, so you can still transparent. Like, oh, the like guy in the cockpit? That's how that was done. And then here's another, I think this might be one of your masterpieces yeah. here, right? The Crusader, uh, Crusader shuttle. Yeah. So. And again, you can see that the, some of the, they, they wanted to do more and more airbrushing. And it, I have, for me, airbrushing is quicker. If I had the, like Hector does not use an airbrush. And I don't know how he ever did it, because he used to do his brushwork like this. And not using two brushes, right? With acrylics, you use two brushes. One to put the paint on, one to blend. And he didn't do it that way. Me, I could do it much quicker with an airbrush. And you can see the slick, the, uh, the swoops of the airbrushing. And here's a, here's a couple more of yours. One of my favorites, the, the Hurricane, the, the Sonic, uh, Sonic Fort America there. So, and I got lazy on though, no, I think I mentioned it when I saw it, it reminded me <laughs> with, with the labels and everything that are on it, which are the true labels, instead of hand painting each word, I'd have the actual stencils and then photograph them. And then I would make, cut it out of paper and then just tint it a yellow or whatever I did and just paste it on. So, <laughs> so these are, that, that one's mixed media then, those are little, those little posters. Right? Yeah, yeah. Are all on there. And, um, oh, here's two examples of two painters actually influencing paintings. So that's another example. So here is Night Force Repeater. The original repeater was done by Hector, 
but when you were assigned to Night Force to do it, you basically yeah. had to go over his work. Yeah, yeah. oh, definitely. But we used to try to get, like I mentioned to you, about get rid of all those little white lines that they didn't like. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another. Well, you know, if we have time, we'll go back to that. Well, why don't you talk about that? Because that, that's... Well, if you, if, you find, if you find one that has the... Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, he had to sometimes... Outline, if, he, if he didn't do it with lighting, and he just, like, it, it, instead, like, a, if he had a tangent, where, like, a tangent is, like, a horizon line, you put the mass, like, right on the horizon line. That's a tangent. So but he put, got tangents all over. So we put yeah. it up here. So what you're talking about, are these, these white lines that almost outline everything? Yeah, right. Separated from the back. They're just to separate. But they, then they got a little crazy because he'd use it anywhere. And so it just to separate it. And it has a, you know, if you run into a problem with, the, with a tangent, uh, so he'd, he'd use the white lines. And then I think it was R&D or marketing, said, you know, because it took away from the realism of the actual painting. Okay. So it was all white lines. So, so we had to get rid of those. So you guys, you guys would actually go over paints, oh, yeah. oh, Hector's gotcha. paintings, and yeah. take out oh, wow. the, the white the lines. lines. Yeah, yes, and sometimes uniforms would change. He just you know, yeah. and we would have to go over. Because marketing told you to. Well, somebody told us. It was on the schedule. <laughs> God bless him. He was, he was so quick yeah. in doing illustration. He, he'd have, we'd come, I remember doing a lot of them where if he was holding a gun, a gun would be like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, so you were doing so. We would have to overpaint the, yeah. the orientation of gun. And, for, and, and with acrylics, you can do that. Right. Paint, paint, paint all over. You can't, can't do that too it's much. Very forgiving. Very forgiving. <laughs> Bosch is not that forgiving. No. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, go back up. So but you'll notice that now as you go back and look at your earlier Joes, so many examples of those white highlights, and that's what I've learned identifying paintings. After Doug taught me, I'm like, oh, it's a Hector, that's a dog. That's a, I, you can just tell from the, you know, the techniques, it's easy to identify. A lot of times they would reissue, like, you know, vehicles, and we would have to go in and change the colors, and, you know, put new weaponry on them, so you'd have to airbrush some stuff back to white, and you yeah. are. Yeah. And, then, and then when you went in through the, the, uh, the Tiger Forces, oh, yeah. to change all, the change back. all that, put Tiger Stripes on them. Brilliant stuff for my Yep. Like, no, really, it's yeah. No, it's just repurpose. We, they change it around. Yeah. And make it, yeah. So that's one thing that we don't have any examples of that uh, here. But that's what we found. We do have a, a, a good number of existing Night Force and Tiger Force paintings. Actually, if you go on the headquarters tour tomorrow, we curated one just for this lady right here. You'll see Tiger Force Duke. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll look away. But basically, those are all over paints over the original. So if you did x-ray crystallography on those, you would actually see another painting underneath. The original is gone. It, the Tiger Force and Night Force exist. So it's, it's like, you know, kind of two paintings in one. And in this case, the, the guys, when they, sometimes Hector did it himself. And in other cases, the guys took it over and, um, and followed it. And I think you were telling me, I, th I think, Doug, you overpainted the, the whale, which is the, the big hovercraft. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, no, the Cobra More, which is the Cobra hovercraft. You guys probably know on the art, there's a couple of little stowaways um, down there who are Cobra guys. And um, I don't know if you left that on purpose or didn't notice that they were in the little compartments, you know, on that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I can't remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a funny detail because that was actually another artist overpainting the original but left, left those details. Um, I want to switch gears for a second and talk about, for the most part, G.I. Joe had a very, I don't know, American illustrated look and a, and a sense of excitement and a tone. Um, but you produced one piece that is very, very different from all the rest. And you told me a story about this. Uh, it's, the, it's this Duke piece right here, right? Oh, that sure. you did, that was used for the catalog cover and then the carry case. Yep. Um, th why is this so different? And can you talk about at the time the the movement or the recommendation to try new styles? Mm -hmm. But there was resistance to, to change styles. But th there was discussion about going this way and that way with Joe. Well, they, uh, R and D or whatever, they always tried to get. Uh, they always wanted the comic book look, basically, which is the black outlining and and. Uh, but for this one, 
uh, I had to I had to do this within a couple of days because they sent it out to have somebody else do the do the do the, uh, the illustration didn't come back right so I ended up doing it um, but this is done with um, called blue lining blue lining Disney did and how you do it is you do your black and white outline on it on acetate or chromoflex or whatever whatever you do the black line in. then you photograph it and then make a negative and you, when you do the negative put it on paper you expose it with the UV light and well yeah first you put a wash of a, of a chemical on the board and then you expose the negative on it and then when you pull it off you get a blue line and then that way there you can paint on that and then have your acetate overlay and that's how Disney did it. When we researched that for like a long, long time and that really helped out a lot with a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. So this painting yeah. actually has an acetate layer It has over an acetate overlay. So it's almost like photography, you put, you know, or put all the layers together and then, all, then the panel painting comes together. And when you did your airbrushing underneath, you, you just followed the blue line. The blue line is all So you just have to be yeah, like a precise line. cut in the press kit. Yeah. And because the black line is coming down on top of it, so it has got up. It's been the work up there. Yeah. And it changed like it changed. It adds different take the different techniques. Yep. So. so it looked more comic you know, more comic book. Right. So it, so initially the, the line was set the direction was a comic book look. Were there forces in the company that were trying to change yes. the look of Joe? Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. But, but, talk but talk then it, it, well then, then it, it, it didn't really change. It, it kinda of stayed the same until it started. Okay. changing uh, probably around 1998 uh, or nine when things started to whatever, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't want to say deteriorate, but it just started. Well, they, they branched up in too many different... Uh, too many different directions. Directions and stuff like that. One, first they're in outer space, then they're over here. And then, <laughs> then they wanted like Stargate, you know, they wanted it like this. But, so it never really uh, lost the focus, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, then uh, and so the illustrations started to change at yeah. the time. Yeah. And towards the end, there was more airbrushing too. A lot, yeah, a lot I started airbrush. bringing yeah. in yeah. Yeah. Right. more. They 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 wanted that. Which so I had that background, but we had to then right. showing him that we had the background to do the airbrushing. So what was the reason for the change towards airbrushing? What did it, what kind of look or feeling did it? it it's just some, I don't know. I I. I I like more of a painterly look myself, but it, it uh, it's, it's quicker uh, for me or you know, for us or right. whatever to get the smooth tones on there quicker. Although, like say, all of, all of it, like Hector, just blending, blending, blending with acrylics, and it's like, ooh, boy, <laughs> the two <laughs> kind. But he was he was a master at it, obviously. But uh, that's but, right. Exactly. It's probably one of the last. But he, but even now, if, if, if everything is turned, turned, turned so much. It's all slick now yeah. that's out there when that's the computer. That's slick and illustrated that's, look. Yeah. And that's all the, the airbrushing look. So, so there's great. So they go to it's stuck. You know, so there's not that many. Uh, uh, a quick story with, um, with the New Avengers is, uh, which I mentioned, Drew Struson, which did, uh, you know, Star Wars and he did uh, beautiful stuff, all the movie posters. But um, he brought they, he brought them back. He brought he, he came out of retirement to do the new adventures and you know the beautiful stuff and, and that technique. So you, it's not airbrushing. You know? I mean, he does use an airbrush, but he uses the color uh, pencil outline and everything. So that stuff uh, maybe it's coming back again. You know? So we got the five minute warning. So we'll wrap it up. We do want a couple of questions, but um, Bob, this one's for you. So one thing I've noticed. And um, I, I just learned this, is that in, for some vehicles, especially around the 92 time frame, actually two different versions of paintings exist. And in trying to figure it out, it seems like some of the paintings were used in U.S. domestic release or North America, and some were used in Europe. Do you remember the, the reason or why we have like two examples of these things? Sometimes, like I said, it could have been a comp, the first one. It was a comp illustration. Um, but, but good for suitable for using. Yeah, yeah right. But you know, then we would go on and they would do a, a final one. You know, if the vehicle changed or not, yeah. they would they would do a different 
feel different, slightly different. I, mean, I guess it's different enough. <laughs> so, it just seems like they're so it, close when it's different. We wanted it in Costa Rica instead of uh, Florida. Exactly. <laughs> so, but maybe we'll never know these. But I think I think that's probably one of the one of the main reasons. Yeah. Is the first one was a comp. Because uh, I the the piece that you showed that you showed that Doug had with the ninja the blue the black and blue one. I did the comp for that, and then Doug did the final. Oh, okay. Um, on, on that. So that could you know that could be an easy time. Well, thanks. So um, wanted to open it up if you guys have any <coughs> questions for our legends. They would do what they would do is uh, they in R and D they'd start to do different presentations and then showing it this way or that way. Um, sometimes there were outside agencies that would would come in with that idea too to change. Right. I mean, it happens now. Packaging they want to change it. You know, I don't know why, but they do. Whether it helps or not, but that's what they that, that that's what they did. And it was not our saying. I mean, we could influence it, but not, not all that. And they do it with the transformers, they did it with all different uh, backgrounds. Most of the backgrounds were changing in all the time, yeah. And this question is for Bob, my second question. You mentioned you worked on Cops. I was a huge fan. Doug, Doug, yeah, Doug, Doug, Doug worked on Which is a comic book, uh, comic book like, like I mentioned about that other, um, the one with the blue lining. But I didn't use blue line on that. But I did use cop. I did do cop. I did half the line. There are a lot of similarities with the line and the illustrations to GI Joe. Is there any for someone who's like a fan of such an obscure line? Do you have any other trivia on, on illustrating cops? Um, here? Not much. But like the person I worked with on the outside was Kirk Reinert. Um He was a uh, horror uh, illustrator. And he, um, he, he just started doing that type of technique. He could change it around a little bit. Um, and then the line got so big that, uh, you know, they had to, um, I had, they split the line. So I did like half the line. But I, I, it's funny how, I, how it started off. Was I actually was starting to promote, because they would try to do uh, techniques uh, to, to like when cops came out. And I was going down the road of, like we mentioned, Drew Struson. Like I did samples that had the outlining, and I, I showed a cop that had a, um, you know, one of the toy type uh, weapons and stuff like that. But then they ended up with the uh, the outlining, the comic book with the black outline. Uh, yeah. And so you have to. Ha I'm sorry, you had to work with dyes on that. That's how comic book people did it. They go from line work. Well, actually, they go to a penciler to a uh, black and white, and then they go to a color. And the color was done on dyes, you know, transparent dyes. Yeah, and that's how that was done. So we have time for one more question. Okay, back there. Yeah, um, I, I, hope, I hope I didn't miss what he asked. Um, the flash, the background, why the change into that like uh, graphic look? From the explosion to the yeah. digital? Yeah, the digital. It was just to, just to change it, you know. Per, yeah, just to, to, to give it a different look. Give it a different look. Um, yeah, eight, that's eight, it. Nine. Yeah, that's basically what they, uh, you yeah. know. Whether good, bad, or indifferent, you know, I mean, uh, in some ways they'd be better off not, not changing it, but they, they want, every, every year they want a new look. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of job security when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Have another look. <laughs> All right, well, I, I wish we could have more time, but our legends are you know, going to be here to, to answer your questions. Uh, but we've got to change the room over for the, for the next panel, you know, bring up some more seats. So I want to thank you. <laughs>
questions later. So for